if everybody could mute, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna introduce myself. My name is Karen Albert. I'm the director of the Hofstra University Museum of Art. And as I mentioned before, my co-host is Alexandra Giordano. She's my communications director. So um, we'd love to ask, ask you to leave your microphones on mute as usual. And there'll be, you can ask questions and make comments in the chat box feature during the program. And after, there'll be plenty of time to have question and answer. So we'll leave plenty of time at the end. Um, so as, as many of you know, because I know a lot of you have are repeat visitors to the program, this is our eighth Second Friday program, which the Second Friday program is a virtual program we created to highlight different aspects of the museum's permanent collection. So this week, we're going to focus on on recent acquisitions. Because we are a collecting institution, which means we do continue to collect artwork. So this is the recap of, of, of what's kind of our summary of our collection here that um, I usually go over. So what I wanted to talk a little bit about today is um, things that have, objects that have come into the collection in the last five years. So between 2015 and two, and 2020, um, we've accessioned about 289 works of art. And the number will vary from year to year, year to year, depending on the donors. Um, sometimes we have hundreds and sometimes we have about, we usually probably range around 50-ish is probably a normal number. Um, but we, we have had many more than that in a particular year, depending on the donors. So this graph is just to give you a little idea of the makeup of the collection by category. So most of the, um, mo a large part of the collection is prints. And that's that large red section there on the graph. But we also have paintings, drawings, photographs, sculpture, um, ethnographic work, which includes African work, Asian work, uh, Melanesian work, um, and uh, Central and South American work. And then we have a kind of a catch-all other category with some things that don't fit into these discrete categories. We have some digital work and we have some kind of artist book work, which doesn't quite fit another category. Um, so it just gives you an idea of what's included in the collection. So I want to go over a little bit about how we um, accession works into the collection. Like what's, what's the process when we get an artwork? So there's a, a, standard, a standardized procedure for any, uh, any do donation to the collection. Um, and that begins with a review of a, the specific work of art by the museum's professional staff. So we look at it first in-house. And the donor provides us with the specific work of art. They just don't say, I want to give you something. They have to tell us specifically what they want to give us. So we need to know the artist's name, the title of the work, the date of the work, the medium of the work, the dimensions, kind of basic information. We like to see images. If we're going to actually accession it, we like to see the real thing in person. We want to know about the condition of the work, what kind of condition is it in, and how the work was acquired. So those are some of the initial questions that we would ask when we we're starting to look at the work. So the works of art are vetted to determine if the offered gifts meet the restrictions of the museum's collection management policy, which is a written policy which dictates how we treat the collection. That's part of our, um, we're accredited by the American Alliance of Museums, which is the national accrediting body. And part of that process is you must have a written collections management policy. And that just means that you're upholding best practices in the field. Um, so if the work of art remains of interest after the internal kind of discussion, then it will be presented to the museum's acquisitions and collections committee for their recommendation. So there's another group of people that will look at it and vet it, review it, will make recommendations. Those recommendations actually go to the university president and he officially accepts the work. Um, the, the recommendation of the co committee has always stood. There's never been a question about that. So that whole process can take a couple months sometimes, depending upon um, how quickly responses go. So 
some of the things that we look for in a work, first of all, it always has to be of a high aesthetic quality. So it has to be a good quality of, of artwork that we want to keep in the collection. Um, so it has to be consistent with the acquisition goals, meaning we're not going to take something that doesn't fit in our collection. Um, we're a fine art museum. We're not going to necessarily, we don't, we don't take decorative art. So we don't take things, you know, on that, in that category. So those kinds of things, that wouldn't be part of our goal. Um, we, we, everything has to be in excellent condition and not requiring uh, conservation. Um, that's an added expense that with our, you know, being a smaller museum with a smaller budget, that's something that we can't really do. Um, and so that, that becomes the, the condition of the work um, is something that we would investigate. Um, and if the work would require upkeep over time, whether, what those expenses might be, those are some of the considerations that we would have. We also are very much because um, we're very, it's very selective and we want to make sure that we're bringing in objects into the collection that will be utilized in some way, whether they'll be utilized for exhibitions, for university classes, for public school classes. We want, we want to take works of art that will be used. We don't want to just hold things for the sake of holding things, right? So we want to make sure that they're going to have a purpose for us. Um, we, they will have to have a clear provenance. Now, provenance is the history of that particular object. Um, mo a lot of conversation on provenance has come out of for after World War II with the Nazi era. Provenance research has been the main thing that people know about because there were a lot of works that were stolen or um, confiscated and then ended up in other museums or ended up in somebody's collection. And every once in a while, you hear about something being repatriated back to the family or to the uh, country. Um, right now, there's a lot of discussion about African works that were um, looted, like uh, in the Benin bronzes. A lot of them are going back to Benin because they were actually looted during the colonial period and taken out of the country. So they really they were not legally taken out of the country. So there was a question of legality. So a lot of those things will be, you know, repatriated back to the country of origin or the original owner. So provenance is something that we check. For us, that mainly um, refers to the works that we collect from Africa, because most of the other works, as I go through a list, I'll show you some of the works that we've collected recently, are, are more contemporary 20th century works, and there's not an issue about, their, about the provenance. But if you have a work that's a little bit older, you, that's one of the things you have to check. And you have to try to check the chain of, okay, you, you have it, you know, you have it in your collection, you bought it from this gallery in this year, that gallery bought it at auction in this year, and then, you know, it came from this person, you know, so you go trace the trail backwards for the history of the object. Um, the other thing is the attribution. We want to make sure that what you're giving us is what it's supposed to be. So these things are all research involved when somebody offers us anything. And one of the main things is we don't take something that has restrictions to it. So we won't take something if you say, I'll give it to you, but you have to have it on view all the time, or you have to put it on exhibit every other year or something like that. Well, we won't, we won't make that conditional commitment. Um, so those are, those are some of the things that we look at when we're looking at work to bring into the collection. Because when we bring something into the collection, it's pretty much permanent. So we don't want to be very careful about what we bring in. Um, that's a little bit about the procedure of how it works. Okay. And then once it's brought into the collection, then we do a whole accessioning into the collection and cataloging and photographing and all of the additional research that will go into that process. So I'm going to spend the rest of the time kind of showing you a number of works that have come into the collection in the last five years. I'm going to go a little bit quickly because I, I think there were so many good things I wanted to show you. I had a hard time cutting it down. So um, I'll be happy to talk about some, some individual ones more if you want at the end, but I kind of want to show you kind of the breadth and scope of what of what we've collected in the last few years. 
And yes, we still were getting donations in this past year during the pandemic. They were mainly from, they were all from donors that had continued, that give to us almost annually. So they're relationships that we had already established and we just continued with those relationships. So we did bring in works to the, into the collection in 2020 and in 2021. So, um, so as many of you know, we have a quite a large African art collection. We have more than 280 works of African art, uh, mostly from Western and Central Africa. And it's been really growing thanks in a large part to uh, one of our local donors who was a medical doctor in the late 1960s and traveled to uh, Mali uh, to do, he studies infectious disease as a matter of fact, and he was doing inoculations and vaccinations in Mali in the 1960s. So he fell in love with African work and started collecting it. And through a, through a mutual connection, he came to, you know, came to our attention that he wanted to donate work because he wanted to see the work that he loved and collected continue on and have a life. He didn't want it just to kind of go somewhere. So um, this is a, a recent work that he gave us, um, which is a Dan mask. Um, and one of the interesting things about this Dan mask is it has all of the, what they call the accoutrements, the, the scarf and the hair and the bells and all the embellishments on it. Dan masks often are stripped down of all of those additional items. And we have other Dan masks in the collection, but none as elaborate as this. So this really allows us to do a, a lot of comparison and contrast about, you know, what was collected and popular and what the actual object would have looked like. So it's really very, I was very excited to get this piece because I think it helps with our collection and builds another little link between um, how, how things were collected from Africa and how, and how we you know, view them in the West. So it kind of makes a nice little um, comparison and contrast there. And this is a, what's called a granary lo door lock. So in the Dogon peoples you are an agricultural people and they, they harvested grain and they had these little buildings that would, they were granaries, they held their, their uh, the, the grain, excuse me. And the, these wooden door locks were a very utilitarian thing of hope, basically keeping the door closed, right? But this is very beautifully carved and incised. And I tried to give you a little close up so you could see a little bit about the detail of the carving and all of the, um, the geometric patterns of the, the parallel lines that, that, that create the geometric pattern. So it's another example of, so it's a different culture than Dan. Dogon people are a different culture. And this one is from the Bamana people. Um, and this is from somebody who actually um, know the, knows the other doctor. And she had traveled in Africa in the middle of the 20th century and, and collected some works, not, not as many as he has, but she also wanted us to have some pieces from her collection. So. This is a very unusual headpiece that the yarn and fabric hang would hang down over your face. So that would be okay. Um, so let's see. Okay, so prints form the largest part of our collection, which I mentioned, um, and we continue to expand the range and scope of the print collection and try to fill in some gaps that we have also. Um, because the work is all donated, we do not have an acquisition fund and purchase artwork. So we try to um, locate things that would, would fit into some of our gaps. Now, this particular print by April Gornick was donated by the curator, Eleanor Wright, who retired a number of years ago. This is from her personal collection. And after her retirement, and she decided she was has donated a number of prints from her personal collection to the museum knowing that we had these gaps in our collection and that they would help to fill some of those gaps. And this is a one of four prints by William Hogarth that were given to us a few years back. Um, and we didn't have anything by Hogarth in our collection. And most of our print collection is 
19th and 20th century. So this is earlier for us. So I was glad, happy to get something that was a little bit earlier. Um, and this is someone who lived locally who just kind of called us up and said, I have these, would you be interested in these? So sometimes it's somebody you know in a relationship that you have established. And sometimes the donor is somebody who just, you know, is kind of cold calling you and making the offer. Um, so we did a little research and found out um, more about this, these prints um, and decided that they would be really nice addition to our collection. Right. And then um, we often, often have somebody who collects like the African, like the, the medical doctor who collects African art. Sometimes collectors collect a single artist or a single genre. Um, and I don't, I think, Jimmy was signed up to come today. I'm not sure if he's here today, but um, Jimmy White uh, collects the work of Robert Kipnis, and he has a large collection of Kipnis and has done a lot of work on the artist also. And uh, he had a slight co a connection to Hofstra, and then when we met, we both realized we had a collection to Syracuse University too. Um, so we have a, a couple different connections here. And Robert Kipnis is most well known for the quality of his mezzo. Um, yeah, I'll listen to it outside. Um, whoops. So, whoops, I'm sorry, I messed up my thing here. So, uh, let's see. So, we've, we've got a collection of Robert Kipnis works that includes paintings, prints, and drawings. Um, he's most well known for his mezzotints, and I'm showing you a mezzotint, one of the mezzotints here. Um, and when I, one of the things after uh, I spoke with Jimmy after the first time he donated, he donated us a, a to, to us again because he had the copper plate from the print also in his collection. So this is something that I often talk about with art history classes is about printmaking techniques. So for us to have the printed print and the copper plate that it was taken from together, we can really illustrate to the students how this was done. Things like, as you can see, the, the, the print is on the left-hand side and the copper plate is on the right. You can see that the image is reversed, right? Because when you put the paper on the plant, it comes out reversed. Um, you can see that the ink was in the incised lines on the pro on the copper plate because it's an Italio type etching, so the ink is in the lines. It's not like a woodblock print where the ink is on the surface. So there's a couple different techniques. So this really allows us to sh to give a good example of of how it was done. Also, it's a really good illustration for us, and we've used them many times with classes already. So and I think that was. Yeah, 2015. So even in the last five years, we've used it a number of times. Um, this is a print by Elizabeth Catlett, who is a very prominent um, African-American artist. Uh, we, we didn't have any work by her in our collection. And this is also from the retired curator, Eleanor Rape. Um, and this is, does a couple things for us. It expands our, our scope of the type of artists in our collection. But this print also is very um, new, it's a new, it uses a combination of different, two different printing processes. It uses lithography and it uses digital printmaking. So that there's, so it's another kind of expansion on the types of prints we have in our collection. We have prints from almost every different type of printmaking technique that you could have. And this is really interesting because it combines two different techniques in one image. So it does a number of different things for our collection. I was very happy also to get this in the collection. And this is a, a work by Mark Stabi. And this is, um, he was part of the kind of the what do you call it, Lower East Side, New York in the 1980s. There's a whole group of artists that was a big uh, part of that. Um, uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat was part of that group. Um, Mark Gustavi was part of that group. There's a large number of artists in that group. And we didn't have anything in our collection from that era. I think we had one piece by another artist that was in the era. So um, met a, a the donor who was, his in, the way he found us was his daughters were um, applying for colleges 
And as they were looking at colleges, he would go online and look to see what kind of museums the college had. So they had looked at Hofstra, so he looked at looked at our museum. So then he contacted us and, and said, oh, you know, I, you know, would, would you like to talk about what I have in my collection and what you might like? So he's been giving us a, um, a, a couple works a year uh, for the last couple years. He's been giving us some works in this kind of 1980s downtown New York genre, which we really didn't have in our collection before. So again, it's filling a little bit of a gap in what we have. And then um, paintings are also part of our collection, obviously. Um, these are two watercolors. Um, this is by 20th century American artist Lumen Martin Winter. Um, he was probably best known for doing a lot of public art and murals. Um, and these are just really, they're just really beautiful works of art, but we have a number of works from him, of by him. Um, and the other, um, Long Island Museum in Stony Brook also has a large collection of his work. So they did an exhibition a couple years ago of his show and borrowed a couple of our works for their show. So that's one of the other ways we use our collection is we lend it out to other museums who are working on a similar, you know, working on an artist that we have. Okay. Um, and this is a painting in oil on panel by Burton Silverman, who's a New York City based portrait artist, does a lot of uh, beautiful portraits. And we had done an exhibition of his work in 2011. Um, and then a few years later, he offered us this painting for our collection. So sometimes an artist, and there's a couple artists here that I have that after, after we showed, you know, we maybe showed their work in, the, in an exhibition, they donated a work to us. It's not something that we expect. We often ask, but we don't require it. It's not part of a contract or anything like that. But we often will ask an artist or a collector, you know, if, if we would really love to have this for our collection, if, you know, if you want to consider donating. And this is another, this is a work by a painting by Don Resnick, who was a Long Island artist, a landscape paper painter who also did drawings and prints. Um, he was very concerned about capturing the environment before it changed, before it was gone. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of paintings of wetlands and shorelines and things like that in his part of his agenda. And we had done an exhibition of his work in 2014 and um, developed a relationship with his family. Um, he passed away, but his, uh, with his family that about, and they gave us, well, I think we have like about seven works from his, from, of his in our collection. And so this is just to give you another idea. This is by Stan Brodsky. He's also a Long Island artist. Um, he was a teacher and educator here on Long Island for a long time. Um, and this is just to give you another that, that it, we're not looking at a specific genre. We're not looking at only abstract or only realist work. We're really trying to capture a broad spectrum of different styles. So that gives you an idea. Um, and photographs are a large part of our collection. And this is a really interesting um, print that is, actually, that is actually on plexiglass. Um, we did an exhibition um, in 2015 called From Portraits to Tweets, Imagery, Technology, and the U.S. Presidency. And I came across this work um, by Alex Cao, who's uh, a Chinese artist, but works in, in uh, Brooklyn. And he calls this Lincoln versus Obama. And it, on the left, you can see it looks like a, a photograph or a print of Lincoln. But if you look at the close up on the right, the actual images are these little photographs of Obama. And what he's done is he's tinted and shaded the Obama photographs as like a little mosaic and then put them together to create the big photograph. So it's, um, I think if, if that's kind of, I hope that's clear. It's a very interesting work when you look at it in person, because when you look at it hanging on the wall, it's um, 60 inches high by 40 inches wide. It looks like, a, like a, a work of Lincoln. And then as you approach it, you can see it's actually made up of all these little images. So it's a, again, it's, it's something a little bit different way that our, a photographer would use a photograph. Um, it was very timely, and we used this in the exhibit, and after the exhibit, he, um, 
he just he donated it to us. Um, and we have a large, you know, a large collection of photographs in the collection. We probably have there's more than 900 photographs in the collection. I can't remember the exact number. Um, and so we have a, a range again of photographs. And this is a landscape photograph, but Marilyn Bridges um, does a lot of aerial photographs. And we have probably about two dozen of her photographs in our collection. Um, and she gets a very a different perspective um, because she takes these aerial views. So this almost looks like a the moon or something the way it is, but it's uh, it's in Peru. So. Um, and one of the other artists that we've, uh, photographers that we've used a lot actually with classes is Danny Lyon. And um, we have two groups of images from him. This These are from um, his Texas prison series where he embedded himself into Texas, you know, into the prison system in Texas for a couple years and took images, these are from 1968. The If you notice on the date, it says 1968 and then it says 2011. That's because the negative was taken in 1968, but these particular prints were printed in 2011. And yes, they are signed and acknowledged on the back and all of that, but just so you understand that sometimes that's what the dating means on that. Um, we also have a group, he also did a series on um, called the Bike Riders where he, he kind of lived with a motorcycle group for a year and took photographs of their lifestyle. So it was very much what he, what he was, um, uh, kind of what he did was he really lived with the group that he was photographing. Um, he was initially, um, oh God, it's uh, initially the photographer for SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that was working with voting rights in the 1960s in the South. Um, and his photographs um, were part of the whole uh, project of trying to get the, the voting rights uh, in the South. And um, a lot of that work was used in the North to show what was happening in the South. And this is a photograph by Kristen Kapp. Um, just another idea of the different types of photographs we have in the collection. Um, and this is a, an archival pigment print, which basically means it's a digital based print rather than a gelatin silver print, which is a traditional processed print. So we have different types of photographs in the collection. They're not all the same type of photo. And I re just realized that I didn't show you any color photographs. We do have color photographs too. They're not all black and white. Um, and this is a, another a beautiful landscape by Sally Gall, who happens to be one of my favorites. So I wanted to include something that one of my favorites too in here. And then we have, we have a couple digital works in the collection. And so this, this work exists as a uh, digital file. Um, and you can see the movement there. Um, this is, Dazu Wang is a Chinese artist who does a lot of work with, as you can tell, uh, mechanics and the human body. And a uh, very interesting piece. Um, that, so it, it, we do have a couple other digital based works in the collection, not a lot, but we do have a few. And then the other, uh, one of the other sections of our collection is drawings. And these are a couple works by Yonya Fain that are in our collection. So these happen to be ink on paper. We have all different types of drawings from all different types of media. Um, actually, I'm gonna talk about drawings in a month, but um, this isn't Mark Kostabi, the one of the works from that group from the um, 1980s Lower East Side um, called The Three Graces. Um, there's a lot of art historical references here, <laughs> if you, know uh, about the, I think it's Botticelli, Three Graces, is that what it is? Yeah. There's a couple different themes of the graces in, in uh, classical painting, and this is very much, the positioning and the, and the way they're formed are very much like that, but, but they're holding their own heads, so that's kind of interesting why they're holding their own heads. So this is an ink, 
a pen and ink and an ink wash on paper. And this is um, another drawing also from that same group from the 1980s um, artist. And it's uh, kind of a very, very surrealistic drawing. It's a very detailed drawing. It doesn't quite, um, didn't have a great, I couldn't get a great, a better photo of it, but um, yeah. So it's a very detailed drawing and he's some beautifully meticulous drawing that done with a, with an ink on paper. And then uh, this sculpture, which if you've been to campus, you know, sits in front of the Emily Lowe Gallery. Um, this is by Seymour Lipton, very important American abstract expressionist sculptor. This has been on loan to us since the, in the, since the 1990s and through his family, his estate, his two sons. And um, with la in a couple years back in 2019, the estate is now represented by the Michael Rosenfeld Gallery in New York City. And the gallery contacted us and we've had it on loan to the to campus for a long time. They said, would, would you like to have that? We'd like to, you know, the family would like to donate that to you. Would you like to have it? So of course we always, since it's been here for so long, we kind of feel like it's ours anyway. Um, we said, certainly we would love to have it. So um, this was donated by the family through the through the gallery um, a couple of years back, and uh, we have a num we have another Lipton that's out in our from our collection that's in the Axon Library building, and then we have um, another one that's on loan, which is on the uh, quad by Calkins Hall. That's a, uh, so we have three Liptons out on campus, um, which is which is really nice and. Uh, the museum had done a show on Seymour Lipton's work back in 1988, so a long time ago. So um, that was, uh, so we're glad to have that as part of our collection. So our, our collection, you know, it continues to grow. We're, as I said, we're pretty selective about what we will take into the collection. Um, I don't know if anybody has any specific questions about a specific work or type of work or the process or anything like that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, if we're, we're a small enough group, if you'd like to unmute yourself and, and ask the question, I think that's fine. Anybody, no? Just one comment from your friend James White that he was he, he is here <laughs> listening. Well, I saw that he had signed up, so don't yeah. want to put him on the spot. Um, and a question did just come in from Barry Goldberg: Are the pieces stored on campus? Um, we have both on campus and off campus storage. Uh, we basically our our on campus storage is very full. So we have a number of works that are also off-site. So this is a combination. Combination, yeah. Hi, Karen, it's Randy. How are you? Hi, Randy, how are you? Yes, thank you. This is so wonderful, wonderful program. The very first piece that you showed us, I have a question about, um, the, I think it was a mask? The bat, yeah, I'll, I can go back. Excuse, excuse yeah, the quick clicking. <laughs> Excuse the quick flicking back. I don't want to. It's good. It's a nice review. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yes, the mask. Yes. Yes. Now on. The, thank you. This is it. On the left. Is, yeah. You know, there, there's a difference. Her mouth went out to the right, and I don't know which is the original, and which, and her and her eye, uh, her right eye, is different than the the little oh, picture well, on I the think right. What is you, it, was, what, was work. What you're seeing, I think, is the fact that um, the angle of my camera, the oh. mouth, the mouth is open. As it's, if you see the um, one on the right, the, what you're seeing in the left is part of the stand. That little, oh. um, this little piece in the mouth, 
That's actually yes. the part of the post from the stand. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. In fact, that's a, yeah. in fact it's the, a myth, of course. And the, yeah, the oh, eyes are the that's eyes that's are that's slits that's and they are open. There are open slits yes. there. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I, I okay. caught that before and I said, I wonder if it was worked on or, <laughs> thank you. That's it. I, I could, see it now. Yeah. One of the, <laughs> one of the things right now is I haven't had professional photographer in. So some of these photos are me with my camera and my phone camera. So, <laughs> so doing no, the best I can you, with my I, phone camera. Yeah. Yes. Clarified it. Thank you so much. Oh, no problem. No problem. So two more uh, questions come in, Karen. One about possibly seeing artwork in person if COVID guidelines allow next semester. And then that kind of relates to uh, Barry Goldberg's question, which is like the process for organizing an exhibit, an in-person exhibit. Okay. Um, right, you know, right now, we, Hofstra intends to open in person for the fall. So we are planning to reopen the galleries for September 1st. I don't want to say too much more yet because it's not confirmed yet, but that's our intention. Um, so our galleries, um, so our galleries, could you get the person out? Could you just get the person out, please? They are so cool. Um, so our gallery just... Um, so our galleries will reopen in the fall. That's our plan. Um, we had, um, we have two galleries on campus that have changing exhibitions. So the, they, we don't always have our per pieces from our permanent collection on view. We don't have a separate permanent collection gallery. So you'll see these works from the collection when they're in an, a, a rotating exhibit. Um, and for the fall, we're going to be doing, um, nevertheless, she persisted, which is women artists from our collection. So a couple of the works in here, Elizabeth Catlett will be in that. I'm not sure what else I showed that will be in there. And then the, um, the Emily Lowe Gallery, we're going to be doing um, Where Were You? Witnessing History, which will have some work, some of these, I don't think any of these works will be in that particular show, but so we are planning to open. Um, and in general, our um, exhibits, we usually plan our exhibits three to four years in advance. Because we are an academic youth institution, we, we kind of assume that Although it's not strictly accurate, every four years we have a new audience. So um, that's we kind of where our guideline is. And our exhibits tend to be, you know, each semester and then for the summer, depending upon how that goes. So we tend, our schedule kind of relates to the academic schedule in that way. Um, and we, we work on usually two to three years in advance for our um, planning exhibits. Um, as I'm sure you can imagine, COVID has changed what we were planning to do in the short term and the long term. So a lot of things have changed and a lot of things are just now kind of getting back on track. So um, we, have, we have our schedule through part of 22, most of 22. Um, we have a couple things scheduled for 2023. Um, and actually, I think we have one thing in 2024 that had been postponed that long. So um, there were some things that there are some things that we were planning to do that got pushed back. There were some things that we were planning to do that just got canceled. Um, whether whether they will be able to redo it or not, I'm not sure yet. But a lot because with with um, COVID, a lot of museums were closed, and a, a lot of that you know the loans and borrowing and all those kinds of things have kind of been all on hold. So. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> now that I forgot what it was. <laughs> okay, we don't have any other questions in the chat right now. So if anyone okay. has any and you want to quickly put a question in, um, but if nothing shows up, then 
that was our last question about okay. the process of organizing. Okay, thank you. Um, so I would just like to say that thank you all for coming this afternoon. I don't know how the weather is where you are, but here it's a beautiful sunny afternoon. Kind of a shame to be inside. <laughs> um, but our next uh, second Friday will be on in June 11th. And we're going to talk about drawings from the collection. So I'll do a whole to give you the whole scope of the drawings in the collection. And uh, give you probably show a couple of the same ones I showed here, but give you a little bit more information about those. So, all right, so I'm gonna... Okay, so no more. There was okay. nothing else in the chat for you. Okay. Well, thank you everybody again for coming. I hope to see you again next month. And um, we are still working on our plans for the fall. We're, we want to keep some kind of digital virtual programming, but we're not sure exactly what it will be just yet. Yes. Oh, you're just getting thank yous. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Wanted to check. laughs> yeah. So we, we, we're working on both in-person and virtual work uh, programs for the fall, but, any, but those will go out and we'll announce those as, when they get confirmed. So we're still kind of working on confirming a lot of things for the fall, as as does everybody else, as as everything changes daily. <laughs> so once we get that all together, so so all right. So, anything else in the? No, nothing else. Okay, just thank You're you. You're good. Well, you're quite welcome. I'm glad you. Glad to share the, the time with you and uh, appreciate you all coming. Yes, I can't wait for the gallery to open you too. <laughs> it's kind of hard having, you know, not having the real artwork with you and being able to do that, to share the real artwork. So it's, uh, it's different when, you, when our, so much of our work is based on, you know, actual objects and seeing real objects to then just have everything be digital. It's very different. So, yeah. Good. All right. Okay, that looks like it's it. That's okay, it. Thanks, great. everyone. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end the program. So thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate you attending. Take care. <laughs>